the cryogenics lab explosion. In the late 1990s, researchers at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands were running a series of experiments in a low-temperature physics lab. The goal was to study the behavior of superconducting materials, metals that lose all electrical resistance when cooled to extremely low temperatures. These experiments used liquid helium, which is stored at minus 269 degrees Celsius, only a few degrees above absolute zero. It's one of the coldest substances on Earth, and it expands violently when it warms. A single liter of liquid helium can expand into more than 700 liters of gas if released into the air. The setup involved a sealed cryogenic chamber, cooled and pressurized to maintain a stable environment for the materials being tested. On the day of the accident, a small leak was detected inside one of the cooling lines. The researcher in charge, a graduate assistant working under physicist André Guillem's supervision, began depressurizing the system to check the valve. Without warning, the safety release mechanism jammed. Gas continued building up inside the chamber. When the internal pressure exceeded the metal's limits, the entire vessel ruptured explosively. The blast tore through the laboratory, shattering reinforced glass and metal panels. The force was strong enough to knock down a section of the ceiling. The assistant standing nearest to the chamber was killed instantly by the shockwave and fragments of metal. Several others in adjacent rooms were injured by flying debris and decompression noise. Investigators later determined that a pressure relief valve had frozen shut due to a combination of moisture and extreme cold, a rare but known hazard in cryogenic systems. It prevented excess gas from escaping, turning the sealed container into a bomb. The LSD Experiment In 1953, Dr. Frank Olson, a 45-year-old U.S. Army scientist was working at Fort Detrick, Maryland, one of the most secret military research centers in America. He specialized in aerosolized biological weapons, studying how germs and toxins could spread through the air. At the same time, he was attached to a classified CIA research program called MKUltra, which was testing how drugs like LSD could affect human behavior and interrogation. That November, Olson attended a CIA retreat at a cabin in rural Maryland. During dinner, his supervisor and a CIA a chemist slipped LSD into the scientists' drinks without telling them, which was part of an internal test to see how trained professionals would react to the drug. Within hours, Olson became confused and disoriented. Over the next several days, his colleagues noted that he was anxious, paranoid, and withdrawn. He told a friend he wanted to leave his job and that he had seen too much. Concerned, the CIA arranged for him to travel to New York City with a CIA escort, Supposedly for psychiatric treatment, on the night of November 28, 1953, Olson checked into room 1018A at the Statler Hotel. In the early hours of the morning, he fell from the 10th floor window to the street below. He was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital. The official report listed his death as suicide, but none of the people who had been with him told his family about the LSD dosing. For 22 years, the true cause remained classified, but in 1975, congressional investigations into CIA programs exposed the LSD experiment. Only then did Olson's family learn that he had been drugged without his consent days before his death. The U.S. government formally apologized and paid the family compensation. The Biford Dolphin Accident on the morning of November 5, 1983, a group of professional divers was working on the Biford Dolphin, a Norwegian oil support platform operating in the North Sea. They were part of an experimental deep-sea diving program designed to test how long humans could live and work under extreme pressure. Four divers, Roy Lucas, Edwin Coward, Bjorn Bergerson, and Truls Helovic, were inside a pressurized decompression chamber system connected to the main diving bell. The system simulated ocean pressure at depths of nearly 300 meters, filled with a helium oxygen mix. The procedure was routine. Two of the men were resting in one chamber, while two others were preparing to exit through a transfer chamber after returning from a dive. Standing outside was a technician, William Crammond, who managed the hatches and pressure controls. At exactly 4 a.m., Crammond began disconnecting the diving bell. According to procedure, the internal pressure of the connecting chamber should have been slowly released before separation, but due to a single mechanical mistake, the clamp was removed before the pressure equalized. In less than a tenth of a second, the chamber went from nine atmospheres of pressure to one. The explosive force blew the heavy steel door off its hinges, instantly killing everyone inside. The bodies of three divers were violently thrown out of the chamber, suffering massive internal injuries from expanding gas. The fourth diver, who had been closest to the hatch, was killed instantly, his body literally torn apart by the sudden pressure change. Parts of his remains were found fused to the interior of the machinery. Outside, technician William Crammond was struck by the flying hatch and died on the spot. Investigators later determined that the accident occurred because the manual clamp design allowed a human operator to release it before the pressure was safe, a flaw that had been flagged but never corrected. The Fatal Chemical Transfer In December 2008, 
23-year-old Sherry Sangji, a research assistant at the University of California, Los Angeles, was working on a routine experiment involving a highly reactive chemical called tert lithium, a compound known to ignite instantly on contact with air. She had been tasked with transferring a small quantity of the chemical using a syringe system. To do this safely, the setup required airtight syringes and a protective nitrogen atmosphere. However, the lab's proper safety equipment was not fully available, and Sherry was not wearing a flame-resistant lab coat. While she was transferring the liquid from one bottle to another, the syringe plunger slipped out. In that moment, a small amount of tert but lithium was exposed to air, and it burst into flames. The fire spread instantly to her clothes. The synthetic material melted and stuck to her skin, feeding the flames. Co-workers rushed to help, extinguishing the fire with a lab coat and a safety shower. But Sherry had suffered third-degree burns over nearly half her body. She was taken to the hospital in critical condition. After 18 days, she died from her injuries. Investigations by the U.S. Chemical Safety Board and California OSHA found multiple failures. The chemical transfer was done without a protective shield, no proper safety training had been documented, and fire-resistant coats were not being enforced. The case became the first in U.S. history where a university professor faced criminal charges for a laboratory death. The Game Show Experiment In 2010, French researchers and filmmakers created a television special called The Extreme Zone. It was designed to recreate one of psychology's most famous experiments, Stanley Milgram's Obedience Test, where people were told to give electric shocks to another person on command. But this time, it wasn't in a lab. It was presented as a game show, you know, with lights, music, cameras, and a cheering audience. Contestants were told they were taking part in a TV pilot and that their job was to press a button to shock another contestant every time he answered a question wrong. The shocks weren't real. The person being shocked was an actor, but the participants didn't know that. They were pressured by the host, the audience, and the show's rules to continue increasing the voltage even as the actor screamed, begged, and finally fell silent. The entire setup was designed to see how far ordinary people would go under social pressure. Out of 80 volunteers, 81% went all the way to the final lethal voltage, simply because the host told them to. When the special aired, France was shocked. The experiment had worked. People obeyed authority, even on television, just as they had in Milgram's lab 50 years earlier. But days after filming ended, tragedy followed. One of the participants, a 46-year-old man, collapsed and died of a heart attack. Investigators concluded it was triggered by psychological stress and guilt from the experience. The show's producer said the man had seemed calm when leaving the studio, but doctors confirmed that the intense stress response, heart rate, adrenaline, and cortisol could have easily caused a delayed cardiac event. The Yellow Fever Experiment in 1900, a mysterious disease called yellow fever was killing thousands of soldiers and civilians across Cuba. The cause was unknown, yet many still believed it spread through contaminated air or clothing. The U.S. Army set up the Yellow Fever Commission, led by Dr. Walter Reed, to uncover how it really spread. Among the volunteers was Dr. Jesse William Lazier, a 34-year-old physician and entomologist known for his precision and calmness in the lab. Their early tests were dangerous with volunteers deliberately exposed to potential carriers like bedding, clothing, and even mosquito bites in order to track infection sources. The team began suspecting that the Aedes aegypti mosquito might be responsible. To prove it, Lazier began breeding mosquitoes that had bitten infected patients. He then allowed them to bite volunteers, including himself. On September 13, 1900, he recorded in his notebook, bitten by mosquito three days ago. At first he showed no symptoms, but within days he developed a high fever, severe jaundice and internal bleeding, all unmistakable signs of yellow fever. His condition rapidly worsened and sadly on September 25th, after less than two weeks of illness, Jesse Lazier died. He was one of several researchers who risked their lives for the experiment. His careful notes became the key evidence proving mosquitoes were indeed the vector of yellow fever, and the discovery led to the eradication of the disease from Cuba within years. The Mercury Accident in the spring of 1997, Dr. Karen Wetterhahn, a respected chemistry professor at Dartmouth College, was running an experiment involving dimethylmercury, which is one of the most toxic compounds on Earth. She was studying how heavy metals affect the human body. Dimethylmercury was used as a control substance, extremely dangerous, but needed to understand how mercury interacts with proteins. Karen followed every safety rule known at the time. She wore latex gloves, a lab coat, and safety goggles. For years, this was considered fully protective. But dimethylmercury is different. It can pass through latex in seconds and skin within minutes, which is something scientists didn't yet realize. While transferring a small sample with a pipette, a single droplet, smaller than a raindrop, slipped onto her glove. But Karen immediately wiped it off and continued working. 
She didn't feel or smell anything unusual. Five months later, she began noticing strange symptoms. Her speech became slower and her balance was off. Doctors initially suspected a viral infection or stress, but soon she started losing coordination entirely, struggling to walk or even think clearly. After several tests, doctors found her mercury levels were 80 times the lethal limit. Only then did they realize what had happened that one droplet had passed through her gloves and entered her bloodstream. Despite every possible treatment, her condition worsened, and within months, she slipped into a coma and died in June 1997, less than a year after the accident. The Fatal Invention By the 1940s, Thomas Migley Jr. had built a reputation as one of America's most brilliant engineers. He had helped develop leaded gasoline, which made car engines run smoother, and Freon, which revolutionized refrigeration. But in 1940, Midley's life changed completely. He contracted polio, a viral disease that left him partially paralyzed. Within months, he lost the ability to stand or walk without assistance. Midley refused to become dependent on others. From his bed, he began designing a complex system of pulleys and ropes suspended from the ceiling. It consisted of several metal frames and cords that allowed him to lift himself out of bed, rotate, and lower himself into a wheelchair. Witnesses later described the device as a cross between between a hoist and a harness, entirely mechanical with no failsafes. He used it daily and for several years it worked as intended. On the morning of November 2, 1944, Midgley's housekeeper found him dead. The pulley cords had become entangled during use, wrapping tightly around his neck and torso. The system had jammed mid-operation leaving him suspended in the air. He had suffocated before anyone could reach him. A coroner confirmed the cause of death as accidental strangulation caused by his self-designed lifting mechanism. The apparatus was dismantled immediately afterward, and the case was widely reported in U.S. newspapers as one of the strangest domestic accidents ever recorded. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss the next one.